We're going to have some Bible reading. So we're going to read from the Bible. Today's reading comes from the book of Luke. So I'm going to be reading out loud. You can follow along on the screen or you can grab your Bibles or phones to follow along as well. So the reading is Luke chapter 12, verses 13 to 21. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? Then he said to them, Watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink and be merry. But God said to him, you fool. This very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves but is not rich towards God. So here ends the Bible reading. Um, We're going to invite um, our speaker, Sam Chan, to speak. But just a brief intro, Sam Chan is a medical doctor, an author and public speaker. An interesting fact about him, which Sam Chan says himself, um, he's part of the shortest 1% of the population. Um, Sam will now give today's talk on the topic, the paradox of money. Thanks, Joni. I was driving in nearby streets, but then I noticed the car coming the other way was on my side of the street. He was on the wrong side of the street, but he never kept changing. He kept coming straight at me. But that's when I realised I was on the wrong side of the street because I'd just come back from five years of living in America where we drive on the other side of the street where everything is round the other way. Your steering wheel's on the other side of the car, your gear stick's on the other side of the car, and you drive on the other side of the street. So I now had to flip things around and maybe that's how life feels for us right now we did as we were told we worked hard but somehow we never feel like we have enough money what if we have things around the wrong way so welcome again to feb talks where this year our topic is this unleashing the power of paradox flipping the script on an upside-down world, asking the question, what if we have things round the wrong way? And to answer this, we're looking at stories that Jesus told in the Bible, where in the story, Jesus has a built-in paradox. And Jesus uses this paradox to flip our world upside-down the right way up. So in this month, we've already looked at flipping the script on the paradox of freedom, the paradox of happiness. Today we're going to do the paradox of money and next week the paradox of virtue, why being a good person will not be enough. But today is week three and our topic is the paradox of money and the question we're going to answer is this, how much money do I need to be happy? We're going to try to answer this in the form of a 25 minute talk from me now followed by question and answer from you guys. So as I'm speaking, Think of whatever question you want to ask, text it to the number that will come up on the screen and I'll do my best to answer that question. So how much money do I need to be happy? We've just heard a story in the Bible from Jesus where there's a rich man who strikes it even richer. He has followed the script. But then we're going to discover there's a paradox in this script and God is going to flip the script for us. So let's begin. What is the script that we've been given? It's this. When I have more money, I will be happy. Let's go to the story. Someone in the crowd said to Jesus, hey teacher, tell my brother to, inv- to divide the inheritance with me. Basically this guy is saying to Jesus, I need more money. So Jesus replies with a story that we just heard. Jesus told them this story. Had the ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. The rich man thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain. Then I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, 
eat, drink, and be merry. This man has followed the Asian dream. He's studied hard, worked hard, and now he's made enough money that he can eat, drink, and be merry. When my wife and I got married, and people are asking us what they can give us, so we're telling the guests, if you're going to give us a present, we're trying to tell everyone, we don't want towels. We don't want an air fryer. And no, we don't want an iron. If you do want to give us something, give us money. We want money because money will make us happy. And you can't blame us for thinking that. Like, how would you answer this question? My goal in life is to what? In 1969, the University of California, Los Angeles, they surveyed all their first-year college students, and they've done this every year since 1969. So 1969, when surveyed, first-year college students said their number one goal in life was to develop a meaning philosophy of life, number two, to raise a family, number three, to help others in difficulty. Ten years later, same survey, the number one goal was to become an authority in the field, number two, to help others, number three, to raise a family. But from 1989 to now, the number one goal in every college student is to be very well off financially. It's to be rich. West, um, the, the Wall Street Journal did this survey. From 1998 to now, less and less people think patriotism is important. Less and less people think religion is very important. Less and less people think having children is important. Less and less people think community involvement is important. But more and more people think having more money is important. And I think we all think the same thing. Like, how would we complete this sentence? If I had more what, I'll be happy. It's certainly not going to be towels, is it? If I had more towels, I'd be happy. And it's not children. Sorry, but it's not children. And sorry, it's not wives. We all know that's just going to make you more unhappy. We all know the answer is if I had more money, I would be happy. Come on, let's face it. It's why we study hard. It's why we gain degrees and qualifications. It's why we work hard. It's why we make our children study hard and get qualifications because we too want them to be the rich man in this story where one day you will have enough stored up so you can eat drink and be merry but if that's the script why does it feel like we never have enough well this is the paradox of money more money doesn't make us more happy and Jesus hints at this in the story he gives away three clues clue number one then Jesus said to them watch out be on your guard against all kinds of greed life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. Clue number two in the story, but God said to the rich man, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? Clue number three, the punchline, this is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves but is not rich toward God. This man discovers the paradox of money. What is the paradox of money? Well, there are at least two paradoxes. Number one, I call it the law of diminishing returns. What is the law of diminishing returns? Well, if you buy a $10 bottle of wine, and you think, hey, that was pretty good. Then you buy the $100 bottle of wine. Well, you know what? It's not going to be 10 times better. It might be a little bit better, but it's not 10 times better. And if you buy the $1,000 bottle of wine, well, it's certainly not going to be 100 times better. I've got blank looks out here right now. No one knows what I'm talking about. So it's going to be hamburgers, right? Okay. So if you buy a $10 hamburger, hey, pretty good. Let's face it, the $100 hamburger and the $1,000 hamburger is not going to be any better. Money does not buy a better hamburger. And money does not buy more happiness. Study after study after study shows this graph that more money leads to a bit more happiness, but then there's a plateau. There's a plateau where more and more money does not increase happiness. And what they've studied is this. What's happening here is as you make more money, you get actually getting more happy because now you can pay your bills. And at the moment you can pay your bills... Now money doesn't add any more value to your life, doesn't make you any more happy. And also what's happening here, as you have more money, you can finally pay your bills. It's actually not making you more happy. It's taking unhappiness away. It's actually not giving you happiness. It's just removing unhappiness. So money actually can't give you happiness. 
Why is that? Well, because of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And we all know how Maslow's hierarchy of needs works. We begin with needing food and shelter. If we can get food and shelter, the next thing we need is love and belonging. If we can find love and belonging, the next thing we need is esteem, being somebody. And the next one, the cherry on the top of the pudding, for Maslow, it was self-actualization. I actually think it's transcendence. We're looking after something more. We're looking after a story bigger than our own story to live for, something, some, some, something with purpose and meaning. So money can pay the bills to give us food and shelter, but we can't use money to give us love and belonging, esteem and transcendence. And studies show that if you do use money to try to get love and belonging and esteem and transcendence, it actually makes you less happy, less loved and less respected. You lose love and belonging and you lose esteem. So this gives us paradox number two, the law of negative returns. This is the law of neg negative returns where you think, oh... One hamburger. How good is one hamburger? Well, if one hamburger feels that good, how good would two hamburgers be? Now I'm going to feel doubly good. If two hamburgers is good, how good will three hamburgers be? And in this moment you think, oh, I should have stopped at two because I don't feel as good. Now, again, blank faces, right? Blank faces, guys. Deep down, all of you are thinking, I could do three hamburgers. <laughs> like, I could easily do three hamburgers. So, okay, let's make it wine. One bottle of wine, two bottles of wine. And the third one, you are thinking, ah, I should have stopped at one or two. I don't feel so good. And it's the same with money. Not only is it just diminishing returns, they've actually found in studies that there is a point where if you make more money, you actually lose happiness. And it's not that more money makes you unhappy, it's the effort to make more money. It's the effort to keep that money that takes away from your happiness. And that's, um, and we know, and we might roll our eyes at that, but we know it's true because we work hard. We work hard to have a home, to pay off the house, but now we're never home to enjoy the home. We work hard for our children's future, but we're now never home to see our children. We work hard for financial security, but now we lose our marriage. It actually takes away what gives us happiness. There, I, I, I used to work with this doctor, this anaesthetist, and he used to joke that when he gave financial advice to young junior doctors, he said, the best financial advice is to work on your marriage. Because if you lose your wife, she takes 50% away from you. That's a 50% return. And I thought it was such a good joke. I had to give a speech in front of partners in, in equity companies. And, and, and I made that joke and no one laughed. And I was, oh, too late. You've all lost your wives already, haven't you? Now, there's enough in this story to hint that the man has nobody in his life because he actually makes a speech to himself. He says, I will say to myself, self, you have plenty stored up. You can now take life easy, eat, drink and be merry. God even says, who's going to get what you stored up for yourself? This man has nobody in his life to enjoy his wealth with. He's got nobody to leave his wealth to. He's all alone. So how can we flip the script? Well, here I think I want to suggest we flip the script by being rich to others. And the hint comes in the punchline of the story that Jesus gives. Jesus' punchline is this. This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves but is not rich toward God. This man only stored up for himself but was not rich towards other people and was not rich towards God. So here I suggest two flips. Flip number one, be rich towards other people. And here I'm borrowing a lot of ideas from Arthur Brooks, a happiness expert. He writes in the Atlantic, he podcasts, uh, and he's also got books on uh, books on this, and he suggests that what we need to be happy is we need a rich, multi-dimensional life. We need to make sure we have a faith, 
a faith. Then we have to make sure we're rich towards our family. Then we have to invest in our friends. We also have to invest in fitness. And there's enough to hint in this story. This guy did not invest in his fitness. He boom, died that very night. Should have maybe worked on his cardio and fitness a bit more. And also invest in your work. Why? Because your work will pay the bills. We need work to pay the bills. But after we have enough money to pay the bills... Then we get into philanthropy. I've changed it to keep the F theme going there. So be generous to others and also use your work to serve others and to make a difference. This is a very rich, multi-dimensional approach to life. Now, in the story, this rich man, he had no faith. He had no family. He had no friends. He had no fitness. He had no philanthropy. He was not generous to others. He only had his finances, which is a very thin way to approach life. But if we have all those dimensions, we will have a very rich life. Flip number two is this then. Be rich towards God. We all have to worship something. So let's worship God. And I'm getting this from a famous speech by David Foster Wallace called This Is Water. David Foster Wallace himself was not a Christian, but he says, he says, we all have to worship something. But whatever we worship will eat us alive because we will never be good enough for it. And David Foster Wallace himself says, well, it may as well be God. Only God will fulfill you. Only God will not eat you are live. There's a New York Times op-ed documentary called Happiness is 4 million British pounds. It came out last year. It's been nominated for an Oscar and it's called Happiness is 4 million British pounds because it looks at the life of this Chinese real estate investor and he himself says happiness is 4 million British pounds. In his interview, he's asked this, why do you need to make so much money? He says, I haven't made enough. Don't think I'm very rich. Compared to the real big shots, I'm a nobody. Life's true misery, he says to the reporter, is that once you've reached a certain level, you'll want to climb to the next level up. If you had 10 million, you're going to want to make a billion. And when you have a billion, you'll want even more. You can never have enough. Now, of course, we roll our eyes at this guy. We would never be like that, would we? But, you know, if we have the plain shoes, we want the brand name shoes. If we have an Australian car, come on, we want the European car. If we have a local holiday, wow, well, we're going to want an overseas holiday. We will never have enough. Whatever we worship, we want more and more from us. Only God can fill us and fulfill us. Jesus says elsewhere in the Bible, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy, he went and sold all he had and bought that field. Jesus says, invest in God. Invest in God and his kingdom. Worship God. Only God can fulfill us. Only God can fill us. Do you remember our original question? It was this, how much money do I need to be happy? And today we've seen that the script we've been given is this, when I have more money, I'll be happy. But Jesus has just told us a story where he shows us the paradox. More money doesn't make us more happy. And in fact, we need to flip the script and be rich to others and be rich to God. So I studied hard and I got a PhD. All that means is I'm poor because while you guys were making money, I was studying. So at the age of 40, I started working and I checked my super. I had nothing in my super at the age of 40. So then I thought, i got to have kids. My retirement plan is my, to have kids because kids will look after me when I got, get old, right? So you can see these are my kids. So I have invested very badly. I, and someone else told me, your problem is you've got boys. It's not that boys don't love you. They just don't think of things. You're going to need daughters, all right? So I've invested very badly. So where have you guys invested? I think from this story and in general wisdom, we need to invest in a faith. 
We also need to invest in our family, invest in our friends, invest in fitness, invest in your work. Work is a good gift from a good God to enjoy. It will pay the bills. That will take away unhappiness. But to add happiness, we're also going to need to be generous to others and to use our work to serve and to make a difference. This leads to true riches. This man was rich in one way, but thin and poor in a variety of other ways. Jesus says, be rich to others, be rich to God. Worship God. Only God can fill and fulfill us. Jesus also says, where your heart is, there your treasure is also. So let's invest our hearts in God. Uh, thanks so much, Joni. Um, and thanks, Sam, for the great talk. No worries. Now, do you know, I have a, I've got a big confession to make this sure. morning. So, you know those people who've texted questions? I left the phone at home. <laughs> So, so, you know, like, uh, I feel like this is, you know, like a good example of, you know, um, uh, me modelling imperfection. You know, like the Christian life is all about, you know, that you don't have to be perfect, right? And sometimes it's good for the pastor to be called out publicly and go, wow, he really messed up. And then you go, I really affirm any way that you guys messed up. I think that's, I'm pretty good at that some, sometimes, you know, like uh, if I'm good at modelling something, I'm good at modelling imperfection. So, you know, we, we walk by the grace of God and we don't have to be perfect. But today it means we're going old school. Yeah. So it means if you have a question, if you've texted it, <laughs> if you've texted it, you've got it there written out, right? So you can just go, hey, uh, call it out. Um, so just any questions from the floor? Yes, thank you. How do we deal with pressures from friends and family who tell us we should be earning more money? Wow, yeah, family expectations. I, it's so hard, isn't it? I, that it's, it's a wisdom and pastoral question. I think deep down, we, like everything that we, we talked about in the talk, I think deep down we've got to own it, know it and believe it. And also just then to know that our friends and family are coming from a position of love that they are actually saying that because they love us and they're concerned for us. But in their world, they can't imagine how you, you could be happy unless you had more money and more. So, so I think what we have to do is say, yes, I hear you. Thank you for your love and concern. And I too understand that financial security is important because we saw that curve where you do have to be able to pay your bills. If you can't pay your bills, uh, there's unhappiness. Like if your car is always breaking down, that's unhappiness. If you can't pay the dentist for cavities, that's unhappiness. So we do need to... So we acknowledge that there's a half-truth in what they're saying. But uh, deep down we know there's only half the truth because the other half of the truth is money can't give us happiness, but it can give us other things. And also personality types. For different personalities, money actually represents something more than money. So if you're in the DISC personality scale, if you're a D, you like to give orders, money re represents power. If you're an I person, you like to imagine better futures, money gives you freedom. I think if you're an S person, you like um, details or something. I can't remember the S thing. But then money means you can be hospitable and, and be generous. And C means now you've got security. So understanding that money can represent something to friends and family. So just acknowledge that, that you feel loved. You, yeah, and, and they should be heard. Nice, great question. And I love the bravery, you know, like, uh, you know, getting, a, you know, it's different just anonymously texting in. So who, who's next person? Come on, we've got some good questions here. If you send it through, just call it out. Yes, thanks. Sure, great. It's Hugo, isn't it? Yeah, I can only see half your face because I'm in the shortest 1% of the population, right? <laughs> see, even this doesn't give it <laughs> enough. You just stand up here. All right, so, and I'm only matching you now. So the question was, uh, the Old Testament seems to link a lot of correlation with the, a faithful life and material blessings like God blessing Abraham, for example, with a lot of money and possessions, King David, other examples. I think two things are going on. The Bible, in the wisdom sections like Proverbs, 
where it says, you know, be like the ant, be like the grasshopper, come on, work hard so you have enough stored up. It's saying there is a link between effort and reward, but it's not guaranteed. It's not guaranteed. So there's a modification. So it gives us Ecclesiastes and Job to show us it's not a one-to-one -one correlation. Faithful people like Job will suffer and lose everything. So just because you don't have material riches doesn't mean you haven't been faithful. But by and large, the pattern programmed into the universe is if you do work hard, you will have material rewards. And even studies show that to be true. The number one linking with um, financial security in the Western world is did you get a college degree? Like a college degree almost guarantees financial security in the Western world. So there is a link between effort and reward. But also, as we know, the Old Testament belongs in the time before Jesus. And a lot of things are very symbolic in the Old Testament for the reality of what happens when Jesus comes. So the temple system, for example, the sacrifice system, the priest system, we all, we don't have temples now, we don't have sacrifices because we now realise God was using that as picture language so we can understand what Jesus would do for us. And in many ways, the material wealth in the Old Testament was picture language for the riches that Jesus will give us when we live a faithful life with Jesus. So now we're not guaranteed material prosperity, but spiritual prosperity, like we will be forgiven we be children of God. And Romans 8 says we become co-heirs of Jesus. We inherit the riches that Jesus has. Has a caveat, you inherit the sufferings, that, <laughs> the sufferings of Jesus and also the, the glories to follow. But so I think the material wealth there, by and large, there's a pattern in the universe, work hard, effort, reward, but also it's actually pointing us to a greater reality that we enjoy with Jesus. Yeah, this is taking me back, Sam. You know, uh, when I was doing my master's, uh, Sam was my lecturer in theology, and we would get questions like this. These are gold questions you guys are asking, and just unpacking them so with such a thorough theology of the Bible. This is awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, like thinking on this one, you know, sometimes we talk about prosperity gospel, right? Um, and we go, yes, prosperity gospel is wrong. But like you say, actually, there's some... There's some truth to the general pattern that yeah. actually generally living a good life, living the way God calls us to live, leads to good outcomes and good financial outcomes, right? That discipline, that uh, faithfulness. And, um, you know, so that kind of thing, we, we go, we, we don't believe the prosperity gospel, that the, that the big message of Christianity is all about like, oh, if you uh, believe in God, he'll make you healthy, wealthy and, and give you everything you want. But there is a goodness to the pattern of the way when we live in line with how God made the world, um, things generally work better for us. But also, like you said, that, that biblical theology then of actually a lot of these Old Testaments are pointing to God's ultimate blessings in Jesus that are not just for this life but for eternity. I think so, so rich, so good. Yeah. yeah, and it's, you know, study after study confirms the patterns in the Bible. You know, the, the stuff, the wisdom stuff in Proverbs, for example, work hard, work on your marriage, raise your children. So study after study shows the number one, word, one of the strongest links with financial security is, uh, you know, are your parents still together? And uh, were you born in wedlock? So again, I know that's not possible for many people, but they, 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 sh but they show the hypocrisy that there is in some, some of the teaching circles because they, they surveyed all these people. Is it wrong to have a kid outside marriage? And, no, and everyone said, of course it's not wrong. You can do whatever you want, whatever makes you happy. Then they asked in this room full of university students and lecturers, and who here plans to get married before they have children? And every hand went up, like 97%. So everyone deep down inherently knew that, that is the passion of the universe. It just works better for your marriage and for your children. You can raise them in, in harmony. And so, so the, yeah, again, the patterns yeah. of the universe, yeah. the, there is a link between effort and reward. Yeah, yeah. Next question. Um, I think we've got time for one or two more. Any brave people? Yes. Yeah, any practical tips on philanthropy, like how to juggle finances? I do have to pay the bills, 
but philanthropy, I do need to be generous towards others. So I think it's, we do it both formally and informally. Informally is the mindset, okay? I don't want money to have a hold on me. And by being generous to others, I will demonstrate a freedom over money. It won't have a hold on me. I know my heart's not invested in it if I can be generous to others. And also, study after study shows if we're generous, it actually increases our happiness. So finances, paying the bills, takes away unhappiness, but being generous to others gives us happiness in the positive sense. So informally, changing our mindset, but then formally, okay, like we all want to exercise, but we have to write contracts with ourselves. Okay, Monday is run day, Tuesday is leg day, Wednesday, like, like um, without these formal arrangements, we just don't exercise. And I think we're, with giving then, some of us then would just say, you know what, I'm just gonna just do regular debits from my bank account. So, so then I can be generous. The, the, you know, the 10% rule, there's nothing in the New Testament that says the 10% rule, but just seems to be a good place to start. And also, there's a really good book put out by, by an Australian. It's an Australian publisher, so it's not easy to find, but you'll find it at Wandering Bookseller and probably Amazon.com.au. It's called The Barefoot Disciple. Uh, it's got a really good chapter there on not just... Uh, giving, but how to give. What are some really practical ways to give and to give well? So it's not like, okay, I'm going to give some money, mm, any, meeny, miny, miny. No, but how to research and invest wisely. So The Barefoot Disciple is a really good book. And it also teaches us how to do the finance bit too. It's written by a guy who was in finance. And the best time to read it, I reckon, is from 18 onwards, the, the moment you start making money. I wish I'd read that book when I was 18 because I would have been better financially and also on the philanthropy side too. So the Barefoot Disciple would be my practical tip. Awesome. Thank you so much, Sam. No worries. Um, Thank you, Andrew. Let's give Sam a round of applause. Thanks.